Good evening, everyone. Uh, is everybody able to hear me? Are you able to see my screen? We were facing some technical issues. So if you're not able to see my screen or hear me, uh, just post on the chat window. And uh, we can get started. All right, I don't see any comments. All right, perfect. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all doing well and uh, keeping safe during this tough COVID times. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this talk on switching careers to data science. First and uh, foremost, I would actually like to thank ideators for giving me this opportunity uh, to conduct this webinar. Uh, a quick note before uh, I proceed, I'll just stay on audio for the time being, since sometimes the video causes interruptions um, uh, to the audio due, due to connection issues, and then uh, I will come on video during the Q&A session. Okay, so somebody said that the voice is a bit low. Uh, I'm on full volume here on my end, so I'm not sure what the issue is. Anyways, I'll, I'll try to be a little bit more loud on my end as well. So a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Ajay Sampath, and I've been working as a data scientist for the last three years with a company called CloudX Incorporated. We are into front-end application uh, development and do a lot of data science and uh, AI type of work as consultants for Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies. And prior to that, I was working as a coastal engineer for a company in Seattle, Washington. And it was while working at this company, uh, I think sometime around 2016, is when I myself decided to make the jump into a career in data science. So I was working as an engineer, a core coastal engineer for about eight and a half years. And then I decided to switch careers. So it was around 2017 or 2016 is when uh, pe people were actually getting excited about data science and started talking about it. It started making a lot of waves in the tech industry as well. And then I heard this excellent talk by this person called DJ Partle, who was the chief data science officer in the Obama administration. And his talk was initially what got me excited to move into a career in data science. And then I decided to join the bandwagon as well in 2017. So this particular talk will focus on how you also can move into data science if you have decided to switch careers as well. Uh, I'll first briefly talk about the data science role, what it means today and the current job market. And then I'll discuss a few resources that will help in prepping for a data science role. And then I'll talk, about, talk a little bit about how you can approach job searches and prepare for interviews. And then I'll finish some closing, uh, finish with some closing thoughts and uh, leave some time for questions uh, if you people have any. All right, let me. So, what does the term data scientist actually mean? To be honest with you, the definition is still ambiguous, uh, and the industry has not decided on a formal definition on who they would call a data scientist. But before I actually get into that, uh, I actually wanted to talk about two other roles that you will typically come across in your uh, job searches as well as um, when you're uh, you know, moving careers and applying for roles and even when you start working in a company. One is uh, ML or rank engineer. So this is a type of role that is very research oriented and uh, will require a PhD in statistics and uh, advanced knowledge in math and computing. And this is just a bare minimum. And these are the people that typically develop new algorithms and are heavily invested in deep learning type applications uh, into neural networks. And they do a lot of research, um, uh, a lot of research into developing new packages for, let's say, Python, R, SAS, what, what, whichever tool you take, and also developing new algorithms. So, for example, if you take the light GBM model that has been uh, very popular in the recent days for winning competitions and as well as uh, using for uh, data science applications. Uh, so that was actually developed by some ML and rank engineers uh, at Microsoft. So typically only these large companies, when it comes to like Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft, these are the companies that typically have 
the ML and rank engineer roles because they do have enough budget for a uh, research and uh, development department. So the other one is the uh, data engineer role. That is pretty cut and dry. This role typically is related to anything that has to do with data and data management. The uh, data engineer would be responsible for staging data so that is available for data scientists and other stakeholders. And for this role, you would typically need to know advanced SQL pro uh, programming. So it's not just enough if you know how to use SQL as a querying language, but you, be, you should be able to use SQL as a programming language as well. And these days, it has also become necessary to know languages such as PySpark and Spark SQL as well, since uh, all the um, all the data is moving into the cloud infrastructure, and you will be building a lot of data pipelines on the cloud. And you also need to be well versed in cloud architecture and cloud ops, be it AWS or Azure, depending on which systems the companies use. And you also need to have knowledge about different database management systems. Again, you know, SQL data warehouses if you're uh, on the Azure environment, and Redshift and S3 if you're on the AWS environment. And finally, the uh, data scientist role, like I said earlier, since there is no formal definition as yet. It has kind of become an all-encompassing role, and when you're doing your job search, you will come across a variety of descriptions like data analyst, BI engineer, uh, data analytics specialist, applied scientist. These are these are just a few examples. It it really depends on what the company's requirements are and how they are advertising for the role and uh, how they want to fill the requirements in their um, uh, uh, in, in in their company. So this is because this is again because a data scientist is expected to know a little bit of everything and wear multiple hats. You know, for example, you will be asked to build dashboards using Power BI and Tableau, and some days you'll be working on building machine learning models. And other times, especially when it comes to smaller companies like startups, you may be asked to do some low-key data engineering type of tasks as well. That doesn't mean that you're writing pipelines and building SSIS packages, but it could be assisting data engineers writing PySpark code and helping them state some tables. So it, it really depends on the requirement. Even in my current role, I have gone about, I mean, I've gone four or five months without building single uh, machine learning model. It was mostly building views and getting insights and doing a lot of BI type of work for the stakeholders for different clients. So, and this can uh, generally happen in uh, bigger companies as well. So it doesn't mean that a data scientist uh, will always be working on ML algorithms and it'll be focused only on that aspect of data science. So that is something to keep in mind. So the next thing I want to touch upon is, should you actually move to a role in data science? Right. And th this is assuming that you have uh, made the decision and you also have a uh, good understanding of how to work with data and you really are interested in working with data because that is the, that is the key. And I'll touch upon that a little bit later as well. So again, the short answer is yes. Um, and the Harvard Business Review recently called data science as the sexiest job of the 21st century. Even today, I mean, there are about 150,000 open data science positions in India and about 2.7 million openings in the United States. And this number is expected to grow, especially in the United States, up to 11.6 million openings by 2026. And with just three years of experience as a data scientist, you can expect to earn approximately 20 lakhs per annum as a, as a baseline salary. Now, I understand, of course, given the current pandemic situation, there has been a bit of slowdown in the job market. But if we are to believe the industry experts, this is really going to pick up very soon. And many top companies, especially you know, companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook, have realized that geographical boundaries are not a constraint anymore. And um, having said that, we can expect to see the job market to grow exponentially. And some of you may already be aware, uh, you must have come, come across recent articles on visa and immigration problems in the United States as well. And uh, there has been a lack of tech talent in Silicon Valley. So a lot of companies are thinking about moving those jobs to India because they do find India as a good resource for tech talent. So I would say that uh, don't give up hope as yet. Uh, continue to upskill, keep learning, keep doing what you're doing, keep building your profile. This is the best time to get started and making a switch and eventually things will uh, pick up and uh, you will be able to break into uh, a career in data science. 
So having said that, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about how you would actually prepare uh, for making a switch in careers. So like I had said earlier, a data science scientist needs to know and understand multiple things. For example, you have to be good at math, you need to know statistics, you need to know about big data, you need to know data mining, you need to understand data visualization tools like Power BI, Tableau, and so on and so forth. So it could mean, it could, it, so it, it, it's an all encompassing role and you need to have a breadth uh, in a variety of topics and, and you need to have a knowledge to address um, some of those business problems that uh, will come to you. So one of the first things that I would say is you need to register for an online course like Ideators or um, something like that who, who offer a structured course, especially if you're not from a tech background and have not really used tools such as Python or worked with data before. Now you can ask me, hey, there are a lot of free resources available. Uh, can I not structure a course myself? Uh, I mean, I, I can read blogs, I can read textbooks, I can follow some people and uh, get guidance on how to go about this. You know, I, I had the same thought process when I started back in uh, 2017. And uh, from my experience, let me tell you that it's, it's not easy at all. One of the um, uh, things is you really do, do not know what is um, current there. You can try to keep up, but it kind of gets a little difficult after a certain point in time. And I also, uh, I mean, after I realized that this is not going to work for me, I myself, I joined an online program called Springboard, uh, which offers online uh, courses on data science, and it, it did really make a huge difference. And I still think that that was the only, uh, that was one of the major reasons why I was able to uh, break into the industry. And there are multiple advantages to this as well. So first and foremost, it gives you a structured learning approach. I mean, like I said before, you do not have to worry about whether you're learning the right things. I mean, the courses have already been curated by experts and industry specialists, and they actually teach you what you need to know. And second, most of these programs are mentor driven. So that means, I mean, you are assigned a mentor and that person is going to guide you uh, along your journey. He's going, he or she is going to help you develop your thought process. Uh, they're going to tell you how data science works in the real world. They're going to share their personal experiences. And that experience itself is very rich and it makes a world of difference, especially when you go to go and attend interviews because you already know how you need to think about a problem, right? And, um, and lastly, you will also get to meet people from various backgrounds and you will get very different perspectives on how others approach and solve problems. So for example, when I was with Springboard, I met people from, uh, uh, you know, sociology backgrounds, economics backgrounds, you know, um, people who are core electrical engineers. I even met a person who was a real estate agent who was making a jump into uh, data science. So when, when you talk to these people and when you uh, collaborate with these people, you get different perspectives and new thought processes on how you would approach and address different uh, business problems when it comes to solving with data science. And more importantly, you know, these things are what are usually looked upon uh, when you attend interviews in some of those bigger companies. They expect you to have different perspectives because they, they have a ton of software engineers, they have a ton of people from the tech industry. But what they're looking for is, can you add a different perspective? So these mentor-driven programs and, you know, networking with people from other various backgrounds really help you in uh, gaining those different insights and applying that uh, in your role as well. And in my personal opinion, these types of courses are the closest that you can actually get to a formal education without attending an actual university. And uh, again, I have to reiterate, it makes, it makes a huge difference when you want to break into the data science industry. So now assuming that you've completed a course, um, you've registered online and then you've finished it, it takes five or six months these days, depending on um, what you're trying to do. There are several other things that you can do upskilling. Uh, I've listed a few based on my experiences here and after talking to a few people uh, as well. I mean, I, 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 I honestly wish that somebody had told me this when I first uh, started out. Yeah, I looked like, it looks like people are asking questions here on the chat window. So what I'll do is I'll come back to this at the end of the talk and uh, I, I will answer those. But, but, keep, uh, but keep the questions coming though. So again, like I, like I wish somebody if somebody had told me that these are the things that you need to focus on. Uh, when when I when I first started out, I think I would have done uh, done much better in uh, trying to break into the industry. 
So the first one that I want to talk about is Kegel. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you have already heard about this. In case you have not, uh, this is an online portal for data science competitions primarily, uh, but there are other aspects to it as well. So I recommend actually starting with uh, one of those playground type competitions. So you you have competitions that gives you awards and medals and money, and then there are uh, there are, there is another section of it that just you know gives you data sets to play around with, to test your skills, to build your skills, and um, uh, and then I'll, I'll dig a little deep, uh, dig a little deeper uh, uh, in a, in a few minutes on that. But then you can all you can practice what you've learned in your courses, and then uh, you can um, and learn more in the process as well. Now, some of the feature engineering techniques that I use today in my everyday work, especially when dealing with some of those uh, high cardinality categorical features, etc., I actually learned from participating in a few of these competitions, and that especially focused on this type of problem solving. And there are many others like that, and I consistently, even today, I go look at. Uh, look, look at those competitions and see if there is something that I'm stuck in at my work. And then I go and join a competition and I quickly uh, try to figure out what other people have done, how other people have solved that problem, what I could do differently. So it really helps be, uh, uh, with upskilling. So you can actually pick and choose what you want to learn. And then the second one uh, that I recommend to anybody uh, who is starting out uh, in, in, or trying to jump uh, into a career in data science is the machine learning course by Andrew Ng on Coursera. And Andrew is actually considered as a godfather for data science education, and he is revamped. Uh, he was the first one who started these MOS, MOOCs, and then he has actually revamped them how uh, things have to be taught online, and he has plenty of other courses as well. But this particular course I'm talking about is actually free to audit. So you can actually uh, jump in and start uh, watching those videos. The only thing is if you're doing an audit, you will not be able to actually, you will be able to complete those exercises, but you won't have a certificate of completion. And that actually comes from Stanford University. Uh, it's gonna cost you around 5,000 bucks. So if you have like 5,000 bucks to spare, I would recommend going and getting that certification as well. So what the, the, the reason why I'm talking about this course is because Andrew, he really deeps dive, uh, deep dives into the nuts and bolts of, um, uh, of, of uh, the popular machine learning models. And he lays it out in a way that it's very, very easy to understand. It was only after watching his videos that I really understood how uh, you know, linear regression or logistic regression model works under the hood. And that perspective and that knowledge that I gained was really helpful when I went to uh, it, it was really helpful when I went to, you know, uh, do my interviews because some of these big companies actually focus on um, uh, some of these uh, brass stacks. You need to really know what what goes on under the hood, because, hood but because that is the way they're going to test your knowledge and how how much you've learned over over, over time, right? So I mean, I again recommend um, uh, do, doing some of those um, uh, doing some of those courses. And then the next one that I like to recommend is the uh, um, uh, the book called Elemental Elements of Statistical Learning. If you've not heard about it, it's again a great resource if you really want to understand the brass tags and deep dive uh, into the popular ML algorithms. Right? So I myself have actually read this book three times, and I will definitely read it a few more times as well. I mean, it is highly technical and a bit dry. But and you may find it difficult at first because it's got a lot of equations and it, it really uh, deep dive uh, under the hood. But I mean, if you keep at it, you will be glad that you finished it, and the knowledge that you will gain from it is, um, I mean, is priceless. And one thing, the one mistake that I made was I, I was trying to consume it all at, um, at all at the same time. So that did not really help me in the first time around. So the recommendation that I, I have is uh, instead of reading all at once, you can pick the chapter uh, or you can pick the chapter on the, on the algorithm that you're working with. So let's say, for example, you're working on a logistic regression model and then you can pick that chapter alone and do a deep dive. You can see what they talk about logistic regression in that particular um, Chapter. So it's about it's about 30 pages per chapter. I would say it may take you like three or four days to finish if you sit and do it diligently. And uh, this will actually be very useful if you're planning to apply for data science roles in top tech companies like you know your Amazons and Microsofts and Facebook. Right. So after you've finished all the courses, uh, read the book, participated in some Kegel playground competitions. Uh, you can you can participate you can start participating in actual Kegel competitions because that 
is what is going to build your profile and i mean if you if you get a bronze or a silver or whatever it is in one of those competitions there's nothing like that for your portfolio but of course this is not going to be easy and uh because kegel is based on gamification so if pe for people uh, who are aware of it you know it you you get medals uh for sharing notebooks so people come and vote uh and then you get medals for winning competitions you get medals for winning discussions if people like your comment on something uh you get bronze medals and silver silver medals and then you progress uh from like a novice to a contributor to become an expert and master and then finally a grandmaster which is the pinnacle of um, of kegel right so uh but the one piece of warning and advice that i will uh give you if you're if you want to focus on kegel a lot is that it can consume a lot of your time and you may lose focus on other higher priority things and uh, since it is based on gamification it can become quite depressing when people don't vote on your notebooks and it can get frustrating also because you're not getting those medals uh because it, it's really motivating and you may see that there are some notebooks out there that are uh, absolutely useless but they would have had a good gold medal in there and you might be scratching your head and thinking what am i doing wrong so i would say don't worry about all those things the best thing uh, to focus on is learning and networking keep doing keep doing it consistently uh, and the medals will automatically follow so do, don't worry too much about those medals because uh, kegel can be used as a great uh, learning resource platform and then the other important thing is also to build your github profile and this is especially for people who have uh, who have no prior work experience in the data science field this actually becomes very uh, imperative when you're initially switching into a data science role so showcasing your work uh, on github actually helps you get uh, interviews and also validates your work at the same time again this is where you know kegel can help a little bit as well i mean if you have solved some interesting problems you can uh, put those on github as projects and you know share it on linkedin and put it on put a link to your resume uh, to showcase your profile again the one thing that to be uh, to be very off um, using github is uh, you should not put every single thing that you're working on so for example uh, if you started out um, uh, you know doing data science uh, using the titanic or the iris data set which are the popular toy data sets that technically i mean you typically people start with uh, you you should not put that there because it's it's it, it can work against you right so unless you've done something very interesting uh, and uh, something that nobody else has thought about there is there is no point in putting those kinds of projects in there and you really want to put only those that you think will add value uh, to your resume and uh, add value to your profile so be very diligent about building your profile and it will definitely help in the long long run and once you break into the industry um, uh, i mean if you land a job or something then you can you can build your profile um, as a, as a hobby but then you will have more experiences to talk about from the actual real work that you're doing so nobody is going to really care about your github profile and lastly and this is especially for people who do not have experience in coding so the one thing that i will tell you and i'm going to touch upon this a little bit later during the talk as well keep practicing uh, solving coding problems on websites like lead code and uh, on and hacker rank you know it's very useful to crack tech rounds in interviews uh, especially in those bigger companies uh, you you will have a tech round that is solely based on data structures and coding uh, like i said i'll i'll touch upon this uh, a little bit more later and then in addition to these uh, i would suggest reading medium blogs on various data science topics of course it doesn't have to be medium uh, you can uh, read blogs on analytics vidya kd nuggets uh, those are free so in, uh, i actually make it a point to read at least 10 articles uh, in a week and it has really helped me enhancing my knowledge in various ds topics so every week i will say that i'm going to learn one new topic or i'm going to read about one new topic for ex for example this week it has been data visualization so i found blogs that really talk about and deep dive into data visualizations like flowing with your data uh, storytelling with data the edward tuft blog the nate silver blog so what happens is um, if i read 10 articles and then i try to implement some of these when i'm doing my work uh, i mean when i'm doing my actual work as well so i i pick one topic every week and i try to complete at least about uh, you know 10 10 topics so this week was data visualization next week i may uh, really look into you know light gbm model just to just to keep myself updated if somebody else has implemented um, you know a different version of it if there has been any updates so that way it gives you keeps you updated and it also helps you upskill and know about the latest trends in the market as well 
And then there is the there is this other great resource uh, called paperstocode.com. Uh, this website actually has published papers with the actual code. So these are people uh, who have done some cutting edge research in the data science field and they've shared the code to go along with it. And the best part about this is that you can actually reproduce those res uh, those results and which is one of the greatest uh, things that you actually come across in data, data science, right? Because reproducible research is not a higher, I mean, it's only now being discussed off lid uh, heatedly, but um, it's, it's one of those things that is very necessary because the code has to be reproducible. The results of your paper have to be reproducible. So the way that you can approach this is you can read the paper, you can see what is the problem that they're trying to solve. Usually they'll have the link to the data as well. And then what you can do is you can follow the same steps that they follow and you can write your own code and then you can see what results you get and uh, the best part is you can compare your code with the actual code that was written so this is one way of practicing coding with the data science and ml in focus and it, it really helps um, you know enhance your knowledge on data science coding as well and some of the things that i've learned by doing this uh, has really helped me with work and when i when i've attended interviews also i've been able to answer questions because of what i learned from coding myself and then finally uh, i would recommend following industry experts on twitter and facebook i mean twitter and facebook are not just for videos that you can use it as a great resource for networking as well i mean uh, especially in the data science community you know there is always some interesting discussion going on and uh, it helps you keep up to date on the latest research you know for example the uh, the latest developments with uh, nlp and gpt3 there has been a lot of good discussions around it. Uh, people have shared how they are implementing GPT-3. Uh, so that gives you different ideas on how you can uh, implement it at your work or your projects. So th that is one way of uh, keeping up to date with these market trends. And um, usually when I, I hire for data science uh, uh, positions and um, uh, interview candidates, I always, uh, one of my favorite questions is to ask a candidate who, or, who he or she follows and what is something that they've uh, learned recently. So, I mean, most people uh, sometimes may, may not have the answer, but it is, it's always uh, good to talk about it in an interview uh, when they ask you about your interests and, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, and they ask you to talk about yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that some of these uh, will actually help you uh, to get started on your journey. And these have helped uh, people like me and others who have moved into careers uh, into data science. So I thought I'll just share a, uh, share a list based on my experiences and what I've learned. All right, so the next thing uh, I would like to touch upon is how do you approach these job search, right? So the first thing uh, to keep in mind is to focus on those roles that you think you will actually qualify for. Now, this may sound cliched and obvious, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated, especially in the data science field. And we actually touched upon this at the beginning as well. I mean, I talked about how data science could mean different things for different companies, and it really depends on what roles uh, people are hiring for. So, I mean, more often than not, you can actually skip applying for roles that have titles like, you know, business scientists or research scientists or ML engineer, uh, even if they say only one to two years of experience and have basic knowledge on ML models and uh, have used Python in the past. Right. So, I mean, because these are the roles that will typically require advanced knowledge in ML models, even though they do not specify that in the job descriptions. And you know, the companies are notorious for underplaying the required experience, actually. You know, they will state that they need three plus years of experience, but in a sense, they're actually looking for somebody with six or seven plus years of experience. This is because it is really hard to find candidates with that level of experience. So they're trying to see if they can squeeze somebody with a lesser experience into that role. And, and because data science has been around only for the, you know, the last five years, um, in theory, I mean, actually not in theory, in practice, it's hard to find people who have like six or seven or 10 years of experience because those people are either leading departments or have their own startups or doing some cutting edge research. So they're not gonna apply for these kinds of roles anyways. So when a recruiter calls you, you need to clearly understand what they are looking for. And you can be honest about your experience so that you don't waste your time or waste their time. I mean, it is okay to say that you do, 
you do not know something right for example you can say that you know python as a data science tool rather than a scripting language because if you say that you know python it's more of a generic statement and a recruiter may think that hey this guy has python knowledge as a scripting language right so they may expect you to you know write production level codes or something like that but that's not exactly what your experience is you have used python packages to analyze data and build models so you you, you need to be clear and honest about uh, your experience and what you tell the recruiters and so I wanted to share this um, uh, example that is shown there. So this is an actual job description for a role that I was contacted for recently. I mean, and the, it says like, you know, three plus years of experience in using, in using machine learning to solve business problems, yada, 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 master's degree, uh, expert level competency in Python and its packages, uh, knowledge in statistics, data sciences and machine learning. So at the outset, uh, at least based on the basic qualifications, it looked like a job uh, that matched my profile. But then uh, I, I, I was curious to know what the role entailed. And after a few discussions with the recruiter, it kind of became very clear that what they had listed as preferred qualifications were a bare minimum requirement. And in reality, they actually wanted somebody to maintain, manage and maintain a team of like six to seven data scientists. Um, so this, this basically entails somebody, uh, I mean, basically means that they were looking for a research scientist or an ML engineer with seven to 10 years of experience. I mean, this also tends to happen because you know the recruiters are under pressure to close position, especially in some of those bigger companies, and they typically tend to underplay the roles and responsibilities. So this particular role, after those couple of discussions with the recruiter, I said I'm not interested, and I gave them feedback on revamping their uh, job description as well because um, this could actually easily fool candidates, especially with people like my experience. So the, then the other uh, end of it is you should not discount job openings such as business analysts and BI engineers and, or data analysts. Right? So these, these may on the outset sound like you know, roles that, hey, I'm going to be uh, pulling insights. I'm just going to be building reports. I'm not going to be building actual data science models. Or, I mean, it could, it could mean any number of things. But this is actually a good way uh, to break into the industry if you've been searching. I mean, if you've been searching for a job for a long time and you have not um, you know, uh, founder, uh, founder, founder role as a data scientist. And I mean, and then you can always move after gaining the required experience, because once you move into the company, you'll get to work with you no know, real world data science problems. And honestly, you know, when you when you join in these roles, if you actually have experience uh, building models and, you know, have experience as a data scientist, even by just doing a course and analyzing, you know, data with Kaggle data sets or whatever it is, it, it adds a it adds a lot of value for the company and they may even be willing to you know uh, let you build models and eventually change your role and title to a data scientist so keep watch out for these kinds of roles as well and because i mean it's only because uh, some some of these roles explicitly will not state that you need to have python knowledge or you need to have data science knowledge but after talking to the recruiters you will come to find that hey okay i actually stand out well, um, amongst other candidates because i have this experience and i can do the ba engineer role as well right so that is that is something to keep in mind so the next thing, uh, so the next question is, how would you, how should you target applying for companies? Now, everyone will have the dream companies that they would like to work for, you know, and then companies that you're okay with for the time being and so on and so forth. Now the recommended practice is to make a list of companies that you're interested in applying to and then classifying them into tiers. And I've shown some examples here. This is my list. Yours could be different. So for me, what is popularly known as the FANG companies, that is Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, uh, along with Microsoft, belong in tier A, and followed by you know Oracle and Accenture, Adobe in tier B, and then for me, my, the tier C is usually uh, a list of startups like you know your Olas and Swiggies and Udans. So I mean, why would we need this? Right? So the preparation required for each of these tiers is very different. For example, you know, an interview cycle at a company like Facebook or, or Amazon can take months. And this I'm talking about you now from the point of time a recruiter reaches out to you, the uh, hiring manager going through your resume, uh, the interviews getting set up. And these uh, companies usually have like six, seven rounds of interviews and it all depends on the availability of the interviewers. So, I mean, I know a person who's been interviewing with Google for six months and he still has not completed the interview cycle. And this is, he's already finished six rounds. So it, it can, it's a, it sometimes can take a long process uh, in bigger companies so you you would not have that time to wait so you you should always prep for interviews like you prep for these bigger companies 
Uh, and then in, in, in comparison, obviously, you know, interviews at an Ola or Udan will probably have only a couple of rounds and you will be done in a day or, do, a day or two. And you may even get a result um, uh, the very next day, for all you know. So, so this will actually help you structure. If you, if you do the tiering of the companies, this will help you structure your search and preparations based on our priorities. Now, ideally, you want to focus your prep on dream companies. And then you need to apply to tier C companies first, as it is comparatively easier to get callbacks from these companies. Right. Uh, they're, they're more responsive usually. And then it will also get you enough uh, practice uh, before you go for some of those other bigger companies. And who knows, you may even land a role that you really like and not wait for interviews with the bigger companies if your priority is just to break into the industry. And that's exactly what happened to me. I mean, it was taking a long time for me to break into one of those fan companies, what, what I call tier A. And then this startup came along, I interviewed with them. Uh, it was a day of interviews and I had the offer the next day. So I said, okay, instead of waiting uh, for the bigger companies to call me, I said, I'm going to gain my experience with these startups, uh, with this particular startup, and I'm going to see how it takes, I mean, how I can grow my data science career. And it's been three and a half years, and I have no, uh, I mean, I have no intention of leaving because we are doing a lot of really good work, and it has uh, helped me out in the long run. So I'm not even thinking about moving companies right now. So you could also have the same experience, and for all you know, if you, if you have had prior experience in another industry or something, and you're joining a startup, uh, and you're doing some really good work, you could be made a partner and there could be more money in it as well. So that is why I would say that, you know, you, you should not discount uh, or underestimate the value of these startups. And more than, uh, more than that, you know, you actually tend to learn a lot more uh, in these smaller companies compared to many of the bigger ones. And I've seen that with my personal experience as well. And one of the bigger reasons is um, the, the bigger companies, the processes are already set up and uh, you may just end up playing a support role to a senior data scientist, especially if you're uh, starting your career in, in data science. And there will not be any scope for scope for growth, you know, for the next couple of years or something like that. But then in smaller companies, you know, you get to wear multiple hats and you learn a lot, a lot more. The learning curve is steeper. And if you put the right, if you have the right attitude and you put the right effort, I think um, the experience and the stories that you can tell when you're going for interviews in a much later stage in your career uh, to some of the bigger companies will really help. So if, if I have to go and attend an interview uh, with one of those bigger, uh, bigger companies, I have a lot of experiences that I can talk about which you know a person who has already worked for a bigger company may not even have. So that, that actually works uh, in, in my favor. So again, I mean, if the priority is to break into the break into the data science industry, forget bigger companies, focus on startups. They are, they are always a great option. So in the in the next few slides, I'm going to briefly uh, discuss on what you need to focus uh, for interviews. So the first thing uh, is to focus on what is written on your resume and what you've listed there. So you need to have an in-depth knowledge on whatever you have said that you've done. Right? So for example, if you have stated in your resume that you've used a random forest model to increase sales by 10%, or I mean, that's just, that's just an example I'm giving. And um, if, 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 you've, if you've put that line in your resume, you are actually expected to know the nuts and bolts of the random forest algorithm. I mean, you cannot just get away by saying that, Hey, I use the scikit-learn package. I implemented random forest in Python. Right? That's not going to cut it. So when I hire for data science positions and interview candidates, I spend about 15 minutes on deep diving into one single algorithm that a candidate has actually mentioned in the resume. So if this candidate mentioned random forest, I will want him, him or her to know what it means, how it works under the hood, how you would change it. Have you used random forest as a clustering algorithm? I will deep dive and I will grill them on that particular algorithm. Because the the idea is to the, the idea is to not overpower the candidate, but to just test how much a person has taken the efforts uh, and researched and understood something that they actually implemented. So if you have actually made that effort to learn more about an algorithm that you have implemented, that speaks volumes to the interviewer. So he knows uh, the, the the interviewer will know that hey, this guy, I mean this guy or gal is like you know. Uh, has a pension for data science, uh, they are interested in learning how everything works. And then the other thing I would avoid is using things like, uh, you know, I use custom loss functions to improve accuracies by 5%, etc. I mean, these may, these may sound fancy, but it can actually work against you. I mean, you really have to be able to, consume, to, to convince the interviewer 
why you use the custom function when there are plenty of ready-made ones available, right? I mean, I've seen this multiple times, especially from candidates who have participated in these Kegel type competitions. I mean, they, they themselves must have not written it, a teammate or somebody must have helped them write it uh, and they used it, but they've never given a convincing answer as to why they were not, they were not able to uh, you know, use one of those standard last functions that comes with all the packages. So if you're able to do that, then yes, great. But otherwise, you know, refrain from using things like that. So in addition to having in-depth knowledge on things that you've listed in your resume, you also need to have a breadth of knowledge in, uh, you know, other ML models and algorithms and uh, statistics, right? So this is what is going to make you stand apart. So for example, I typically ask candidates to explain uh, gradient descent in very very simple terms. I don't I don't care about the equation or any of those things. But you know, explain gradient descent to me uh, like you would to a ten year old. So that that is that is one of my, one of the questions that I frequently ask, and you'll be surprised on how on how many of them can actually even answer that question. And these are people, and these are not just people who are getting into the industry. Industry, these are actually people with three plus years of experience or four plus years of experience. So. So it's it's important to have a breadth of knowledge uh, on other topics as well, and th that is where you know reading blogs and uh, you know reading the stat elements of statistical learning books and uh, doing Andrew Ng type courses will actually help. And like I said, bare minimum knowledge in statistics is important as well, especially when you're applying to bigger companies. You really need to know hypothesis testing, probabilities, uh, estimations in central limit theorems so i mean i would definitely recommend um, uh, spend uh, spending time on reading beginner level books on probability probability and statistics and there are a lot of free books that are available there is one by brian Gaffo. it's it's an excellent book to get you started on statistics and that's all the knowledge that you will need if you have to crack uh, an interview with a bigger company and lastly uh, if you do not know something, you just have to confidently say, I don't know, but you're willing to find out and learn. I mean, after all, not everybody is going to know everything, right? So if you try to make things up, it will most definitely work against you. So always say that don't you don't know if you can't speak on a certain topic with confidence. And that 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 is actually better than trying to make things up and getting caught and you know uh, sounding silly. So, uh, so one of the other key things when it comes uh, to prepping for interviews is mock interviews. And this may this may sound tedious, but it has helped me in the past, and it definitely helps uh, to do a few of these before actual interviews. The the biggest advantage is that it reduces anxiety and stress. I mean, even if it is just a stimulated uh, simulated environment. I mean, you will think that you may know all the answers, and you may have even practiced in front of a mirror, but you will actually be surprised what your weak spots are. I mean, some of the areas that you uh, typically think, hey, I'm really good at this, may actually end, end up being your weak spots. And this you can find only by doing mock interviews. Right? And more importantly, you get valuable feedback you know, on your body language, eye contact, the way you speak, you sp the, the, uh, I mean, how slow are you or how fast are you? So these things really help uh, when you're attending interviews and can make a market difference uh, to the interviewer. Right. And then there are these days there are services that do company specific interviews as well. For example, if you're interviewing with Amazon and want to do a prep, they have experts. I mean, when you want to do a prep uh, with a mock interview, they have experts who conduct interviews in the same style. And of course, these services are very expensive and can cost upwards of you know 10,000 Indian rupees. Uh, there are other cheaper options available as well who do like general uh, data, site, uh, data science type interviews. So, I mean, if anybody has upcoming interviews, uh, and would like to do a mock interview. I mean, I'm more than happy to volunteer and do one for free. So, I mean, because uh, people have done it for me, it has helped me and uh, I don't mind passing on that knowledge to others uh, who want to uh, make use of that. So, I mean, take mock interviews very seriously and practice and it will definitely do wonders for you during the actual interviews. So the, the next topic is a, a very highly debatable one. Uh, why is there a coding ground for data scientist interviews? I mean, I, most of you may have heard this. It's been uh, a point of uh, discussion in LinkedIn these days. So I'm, I'm not sure if the smaller companies focus on this, but this is definitely true for all the top companies. You will have a text cleaning ground that involves coding. Now, coding means different things in different contexts. So if you're cleaning and analyzing data in Jupyter notebooks, I mean, it's still considered coding. 
but the tech rounds in these companies typically focus on writing algorithms and data structures you know depending on the level uh, or the role that you're applying for they can ask questions like you know reversing the string without using a library you know, or find two numbers in an array that equal a specific value you know, or some something in that flavor so if you do not come from a coding background this can be overwhelming right i mean like me i i have never coded in my life until, until i decided to move into data science so my first interviews uh, those tech rounds were a, um, were a little bit of a concern for me and unfortunately you cannot escape it these days so i mean my recommendation is to spend considerable considerable amount of time you know solving coding type questions so hacker rank and lead code are great resources uh, and they are free I myself actually even today use Leap Code to pra practice algorithms when I have some free time because I constantly want to learn Python as a scripting language. So I mean, and solving only those questions that are marked easy is mostly all that is needed and will do it. Uh, will definitely boost your confidence. And the one thing that has been very effective for me is kind of maintaining a spreadsheet with all the questions that I've solved. So I make notes like if I have solved the question in the first attempt, uh, if I did not solve what went wrong, what I need to know, what I need to study more, and then I put some hints and pointers, and then I will come back to it uh, you know, a week or two later and uh, try to solve it again without looking at the solution. So that, that has been very uh, effective for me uh, in learning uh, coding from more of a you know, scripting standpoint. And I also go back to the, I mean, um, and then there is plenty of, uh, I mean, so there are about 1,300 questions on lead, uh, lead code and about uh, 500 or 600 of them have been marked as easy uh, as of today. So I think that is plenty, plenty enough practice. I mean, even if you do like 200 or 300, you should be uh, ready, ready from an interview standpoint. And then the coolest thing is if you pay for a subscription, you will get to know what kind of questions are being asked in which companies. So they will tell you this company has been asked, uh, this, sorry, this question has been asked in Amazon in the last six months. Right. Or this has been asked 16 times in the last two years, and it gives you interesting statistics like that. Uh, and most importantly, people also post their interview experiences, and it's a great resource for preparing. Uh, they give you you can gather a lot of insights on how what questions were asked, how people approached it, what were the follow up questions, how they optimized a certain solution. So these things can actually help. I mean, even though it is it is more tailored towards uh, software engineering roles. Uh, you can still gain a lot of insights from what people are talk, uh, talking about in terms of their interview experience. So I would say uh, uh, put some time on, on your calendar and try to solve some of these qu uh, questions if you have an uh, interview coming up, and especially if they've told you that there is going to be a coding tech round. And mostly you will find questions from lead code. So, and then finally, uh, I would like to talk about the, uh, the behavioral type questions. I mean, there, are, there is actually a common misconception that these behavioral questions are easy to answer and that, and that the tech rounds are the hardest. You will actually be surprised to see how many of the candidates actually fail to answer the behavioral questions. I mean, they would get through the tech round because it's, um, it's a standard format. You know what you need to solve for and you can, you can be done with it. In fact, companies like Amazon and Microsoft have like four or five rounds on just these behavioral questions. And these are these are harder than uh, people actually think. So there are actually two types. So one could be a general question like, hey, how do you resolve a work conflict? Right? When you get, or what is your biggest strength or what is your biggest weakness? So when you get these kinds of questions, you always you know, start with a philosophical answer. Uh, like for example, in the conflict question case, you can say conflicts always need not be bad. So you start with something like that and then um, you move on to the other part of the answer on how you would actually resolve a conflict at work. So the second type of question is uh, typically a situation type question. So it would be like, tell me about a time when you disagreed with your manager. Right. So with these kinds of questions, you frame the answers on what has now become the popular star format. So first you set, set the stage by briefly talking about the situation, the task you had to complete, and then what action you took and what was the result. So when you're answering these questions, think about this as telling an interesting story and you are the protagonist of the story. Right? Make a very nice screenplay, the result al but the result always has to be something significant in your story. So, I mean, if you typically watch a movie, uh, the, the hero struggles, he has an anti-climax, and then he solves the problem, and he's considered, I mean, he's considered great. I mean, I'm talking about typical, you know, masala movies. So that is how your answer has to be, right? But make sure you complete your uh, story within two to three minutes so that you do not lose the interest of the interviewer. Then there will be follow-up questions that you can answer directly. 
And like I mentioned earlier, these questions are not very easy to answer and you really need to spend a lot of time on developing answers to these and you'll be surprised uh, when you're working on some of these questions on uh, what you've done and what you've not done and what your weak spots are. So how about five or six examples that you can fit uh, into any situation. So, I mean, so for example, uh, in this conflict question, you can have one example uh, that can fit into a conflict question and it can fit into a time uh, when you had to go against your hiring manager and any question in that kind of a flavor, right? And there are a lot of examples of these questions online. So you can Google and uh, easily find what are the typical flavors. So you can have like five or six examples so that you can have one for uh, one example can fit, fit multiple situations. So the reason why uh, you need to have like five or six examples is because sometimes interviewers will ask you multiple questions and uh, you're not expected to repeat uh, your example. So this basically uh, tells them that there's a pattern of out of the box thinking. So write these examples down as proper stories and keep practicing them, you know, record yourself and see how you can make it better. Uh, I, I still do it. I mean, when I when I when I uh, get a, when I when I'm working on an interesting project, if I think in the future, if I attend an interview, this project is something that I can talk about. I write a story. I practice. I mean, I record it. I keep it for. I mean, I keep it for reference for uh, for later uh, times. So keep doing it until you can tell these examples even in your sleep, right? So even if you're not able to answer these uh, questions, the tech questions satisfactorily during an interview, but if you're able to do well on these behavioral questions, most likely the uh, interviewer uh, would be favorable in their decision. So do, do, don't take these questions lightly and uh, put some uh, effort into practicing those. So finally, some closing thoughts. Uh, one key thing to remember is that data science is a marathon. Uh, it is an ever growing and rapidly changing field. You know, there's always something new to learn. It's not like you get a job and you're done, right? So keep reading books, keep reading blogs, be aware of what is happening in the field and keep short term goals and learn about things that you don't know. I mean, for example, you don't have to learn neural networks in two months, but pick a project and work on it slowly and consistently and until the time you get the hang of it. So like I said, I mean, I've put like 50 points that I want to, 50 topics that I want to learn this year, right? I may not get to finish all the 50 topics, but that, that is my way of motivating myself and keep telling myself, hey, this is what I don't know. I need to be working on this. So recently I, I wanted to learn about convolutional neural networks because I never had the opportunity to apply it at work. So I picked a Kegel data set, the melanoma skin cancer classification problem, and then I've been working on the competition ended last month, but I'm still working on that problem because every day I'm learning something new. So keep at it. And like I said, it is a marathon. Right? And then the next thing is that uh, to keep in mind is that the imposter syndrome is real. So for those of you who have not heard about it, it is a feeling of you know constant self-doubt and a feeling of inadequacy, even after being competent and successful. Right? So a lot of people actually face this. And especially if you're a person who has not had a formal education in data science, but did you know online courses and you're a self-taught data scientist, this can be a tough, uh, tough cookie to crack. Right? So to be honest with you, it took me a year or so to overcome imposter syndrome. And this is after finding a job, being successful in job, building a team of data scientists, I still had the imposter syndrome. But eventually over a period of time, uh, I, I gained confidence and now I, now I don't feel like I'm an outsider to the industry at all. So it, it takes time, but you will overcome your fears. So the, the key is to just keep at it. Right? And I, I honestly think that imposter syndrome is what made me consistently improve my skills and uh, be successful. So make that fear work for you. And then the third uh, thing I would uh, talk about is networking. Uh, this, is an, this is an obvious one. So keep sharing your work on Kegel and LinkedIn. Uh, use Kegel to find teammates for competitions. Uh, it's a really great way to learn and network. I mean, I've made some really good friends in the process. Even though I did not win any competitions, we still uh, get together, chat about latest trends and how we how we are solving or how we are thinking about solving a certain problem. So it's, it's a great networking opportunity. And then in addition to networking, keep building your brand. This has become a very important thing these days, especially uh, for data scientists. You know, of course, Kegel and LinkedIn are the best sources uh, for that. And other than that, I would suggest you know, join discussions on Twitter and Facebook. I mean, by that mean by that I mean relevant ones that can actually help you on your profile. I mean, I've actually seen people being offered interviews just because they had something interesting to say during these discussions. Right? So write blogs if you're interested in writing. It's a great way to showcase what you know and what you've learned. I mean, I started creating one recently. 
and I found that there are things that I need to know. And uh, it, it actually gives me confidence when I write blogs because I also am learning. Uh, and at the same time, it's also a validation that people are reading it and accepting what I know. So that is also one way to beat imposter syndrome. Right? So if you keep building your brand, if you keep doing all these things, you'll be surprised at how many people reach out to you uh, for, uh, for data science roles. I mean, when I started out, uh, I had to run behind recruiters and I had to run behind hiring managers and people to make references for me. But now because I have a profile on Medium, I have a profile on Kegel, you know, people uh, come to me and uh, they ask me whether I'm interested in a particular role. And finally, I mean, I would say enjoy the journey. There could be days where you feel all oh, this is pointless. I mean, I quit data science twice before taking the final plunge. There were days when I felt that this is not my cup of tea. I should be something doing something different. Maybe stick with engineering. Why am I doing this at all? So if you feel the same way, I mean, it's OK to take a break and you know, jump back in. I took a break for a month or a couple of months, if I remember correctly. And then I got back uh, into it. And then I, uh, I am a data scientist today. Right. So like I said earlier, it is a marathon. So pace yourself, start enjoying what you do and, you know, success will follow automatically. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, I hope you found it useful and uh, hope my pointers will help you in your journey to uh, get in, or in to break into the industry. And uh, feel free to ask any questions if you have any at this point. And I'll come on video now. So I do see a few questions uh, here. So there is one, <coughs> excuse me. It says that is, that, is that true? Will they encourage people from different backgrounds? This is actually definitely true uh, these days, especially when you're, um, when you're thinking of jobs in uh, some bigger companies like Amazon and Facebook and even startups for that matter. They do not want the same thinking that the other people are doing. So the, a person coming from an engineering background has a very, very different perspective on how he would solve a particular problem as compared to a person who has worked in, in the tech industry at all times. So and the experience that you share, especially in the behavioral type questions, are some things, some of those things that they would never heard. In fact, when I went attended interviews, when I was talking about my coastal engineering experience, people actually liked it because it was a different thing and they automatically get interested in these kinds of things. So, I mean, I, I would definitely say they do encourage because at the end of the day, I mean, given that uh, the way the data science field is structured today, I think only uh, you can be, you can be a successful team only if you have people from different perspectives and different backgrounds. So I'm, I'm hoping that that uh, answers that question. Any follow ups on that? OK, so the next question is, how is analytics edge course from MIT? I cannot actually speak to that. Uh, to be honest, I have not uh, done a review on it, so I don't know. So I think uh, you need to go by what the online reviews say or talk to some people who have uh, already taken it. So that would be my answer for that. So the other question is, uh, sometimes blogs takes too much time and they may not add value. So question is how to get the right blog. So is, the, is this question related to reading or writing? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna assume that uh, it's uh, reading. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a this is a catch twenty two situation because some of these blogs can actually be um, uh, some of these blogs can be clickbaits. I mean, the title will be amazing, uh, but I mean the, the content will be very silly. So. For example, you know, I, I actually wrote a blog that was uh, that was written with pure clickbait in mind, right? So I, I the, the title of the blog was "Is Your Wife Cheating on You?" A Bayesian approach to the uh, answer, right? That was the title, and it had like 60 views in an hour, right? But at the end of the day, it was just talking about Bayesian, um, a very very basic level Bayesian uh, Bay or base theorem. Right. So it, it, it is difficult to find. But the, the thing you can do is you can follow some of those really verified blogs. Uh, so, for example, you know, 538 is a very good blog. It is run by a person called Nate Silver. 
right? So he actually started his data science journey as um, uh, as a blogger, and uh, he uh, he was actually I think uh, a finance analyst or something, and then he became a core political data scientist by writing blogs. So there are there are a few things that. Um, a few few blogs that are, that are really good. Uh, so you can actually go on Medium. You will see some of these uh, users that um, are projected as gold members or something like that. So those blogs are definitely uh, worthwhile reading. And then I, I think most of the um, uh, most of the blogs on as far, as far as I've seen blogs on websites like KD Nuggets and um, I know Analytics Vidya, the popular ones. They actually do a very good job. So it, it also depends on what you want to learn. So for example, if you're going to read a blog on a random forest model, uh, it's hard to know from the outset if that blog is going to help you or not. So the, the first thing I would do is just scan. And if a blog has a, a content section, I think that is a sign of a very good blog. So you will know that uh, these are the points that are going to uh, that they're going to talk about. So when I come across a blog, if I am looking for some implementation, so let's say for example, feature uh, tuning and hyperparameter tuning or something like that for light GBM model, and if I find a blog that talks about it, be it Medium or be it uh, you know Analytics Vidya, I first look if there is an introduction and uh, what they're going to talk about it. If the if they don't mention uh, any of those things and if they if they, if, they, if they write about introduction to light GBM, I'm not going to be interested. So the first subtitle that they have there itself will let you know if that blog is going to answer your question. So you, you, need, to, uh, you need to start reading uh, and then you will kind of understand how to uh, pick it apart in what, uh, what um, works for you and what doesn't work for you. Okay, so how to project yourself with no experience as data analysts, as people are looking for experienced resources. So this is what so this is what I'm talking about, right? So uh, this is going to be mostly uh, dependent on what you did in Kegel and uh, how you built your GitHub GitHub profile. So you could, um, I mean, you so you can put like, so what, what people are doing these days, if you're doing a course for like six months to eight months or something like that, they call that as one year of experience, right? So you can call yourself as an experienced uh, person. And uh, I mean, obviously, if the... Uh, if the job profile is going to say five plus years of experience, you're not going to uh, you're not going to apply for the role at all. But there are opportunities where they talk about one to two years of experience, and this is where the um, uh, the BI engineer type role comes into play, right? So there, there are other there, there are other facets of data science where you can uh, get into. So for example, all you need to do is build uh, build a very cool Power BI dashboard. In fact, one one of the people I know, he built a very cool Tableau dashboard for COVID, and he's just starting out uh, and trying to figure out a, a career in data science. And he was able to land a BI engineer role with only that, right? So uh, it it can it can be difficult and. Um, so it, it could be uh, again. Uh, so again, don't discount startups. A lot of these startups uh, will look upon prior experience, not as a data analyst, but what you've done in other fields and what your experience is. If you have a strong math and quads background, for example, if you've been a mechanical engineer and run uh, and you've done computational fluid dynamic models for six years, that is a uh, that, that is actually a very good. Uh, fit for a uh, one to two years of experience in data data science because uh, because you work with data you know how to uh, do a computational fluid dynamics model you understand calculus you understand models you understand uh, math so I think um, those things are valued uh, by a lot of companies these days so again there, there could be situations where I mean even in my situation there is the recruiters have told me hey you don't have prior experience we can't um, uh, we, we can't uh, get you into the interview loop in fact even after three and a half years I've had a recruiter tell me that uh, you're you do not have a tech industry background even though the company is not into the tech industry so yeah you could uh, get into those situations so uh, I, I think keep at it and look for look for smaller level entry level roles. It's okay. Once you break in, you can always uh, grow and progress. What do we do when uh, we do not get responses by applying on company on website? Okay, so uh, this you, you uh, to be frank with you, you cannot do anything about it, and uh, do not do not apply on websites. It's not going to help you at all. Uh, that would be my honest uh, feedback and recommendation. And this is where networking uh, comes into play. So if you if you go into LinkedIn, uh, if you find a job posting, 
if that job posting has a recruiter, uh, send an email to the recruiter directly or find the hiring manager, set up informational interviews. Those are the those are a great way uh, to get in, uh, to get actual interviews. So by informational interviews, I mean uh, so you can you can pick a company uh, that you're applying for. Let's say, for example, uh, let's say Ola. Right. So you want to um, you want to apply for you saw a job posting in Ola and you want to uh, apply for that role and it kind of matches your profile. So it says an entry level role on something like that. You can actually reach out to people in Ola uh, in the data science um, uh, or people who are doing data science in Ola and ask them for a quick chat, like 15 to 20 minutes, you know, just to understand what the role is, what um, uh, what, what do you need to know, uh, talk about your experience and, you know, do an informational what Ola does as a company. I mean, of course we know, but what, what do they do in terms of data science? So when you, when you set up these informationals and then, you know, um, you can ask for a recommendation or a reference. I mean, a lot of people are willing to help. I mean, I I, I, have, I have done informational interviews uh, on both ends. So people have reached out to me uh, for informational interviews and I have reached out to people. I've reached out to people in Expedia, in eBay. I've reached out to people in Apple. They, they were more than happy to talk to me and uh, you know guide me on uh, how I can build my profile, what I need to know to join a company like Apple or on Amazon. So uh, you, you, you can do some of those things and you always ask for referrals. I mean, if your friends are working there, um, you can ask them to uh, give, in, give in a reference and talk directly to the hiring manager. So, but because if, if you apply on a website and the company is not, uh, the, the company is most likely not going to respond to you or it's going to take like you know, six or seven months um, uh, for them to respond to you. So that, that is just a waste of time. Instead, I would focus your energy on doing informational, talking to people, network, you know, be on Kegel, uh, like I said, you know, ta John, make friends on Kegel. They may have openings or they you can do informationals with them on uh, in their companies. So, and then at a later stage, when you find a job opening, you can obviously take, a, uh, I mean, it would be easier to reach out to them and, um, you know, ask them for a reference so that you will be called in for an interview. So that's what I would do. So, I mean, don't, don't uh, waste time in applying directly on our website. So many JDs ask for five or more years of experience also to be joined as a fresher or previous experiences accounted for. So this, uh, this is a problem that I faced as well. Uh, when I first uh, started, uh, like I said, I mean, if it's five or five or four years, five plus years of experience is what they put in the job description. It's most likely they want somebody with eight or 10 years of experience. And this I touched upon uh, briefly during my talk as well. So look for roles, um, look for entry level roles. It's okay. I mean, you can look for one to two years of experience. The role that I uh, actually, uh, there was a company called Nutanix. I don't know if you've heard, heard of it. So they were asking for one to two years of data science experience, but they were willing to consider somebody at an entry level position, uh, given my course background and what I've done previously. So by, by what I've done previously is, you know, I do have a quantitative and a math background uh, coming from an engineering um, coming from an engineering uh, you know uh, type of field so and i mean it's it's not it's not like uh, if everybody is going to be in the tech background when they jump into data science right so i know, i know, like i said i know real estate agents who have become data scientists and i know people um, you know who have worked as um, i mean who have uh, phd's in uh, sociology have become uh, um, data scientists. I mean, one of the most famous influencers on Twitter, Chris Alban, he had a PhD in sociology and he's one of the renowned data scientists right now, right? So it, it really depends on the company and it really depends on the role. So I think it's, it's okay uh, to apply for a fresher position and um, because you know what you've done in the past. So if you are able to say that you've used data in some form or the other in your previous job, so it, could, it could be very simple. It doesn't have to be build ML models. You could have done data modeling on Excel for all you know, right? So if, if you have that kind of experience that you can speak to, I think that, that can be considered as one to two years of experience. So you don't have to underplay those things. It's not just about running machine learning models in Python. And if, you, if you've created plots for presentations, if you have uh, given insights and an, a, a analytics, it's, it's all, it, it is all counted. So uh, machine learning, the model part of it is only about 10%. And this is where most people have a common misconception. They think that, hey, I need to have built, you know, machine learning models and stuff like that. So again, like I said, it doesn't have to be a data analyst role, it can, uh, data scientist role, it can be a BI engineer role or a data analyst role or, or, or something like that. So you can, you can look for those roles and then you can um, uh, build your profile and move into a, a data science role as well. So I hope that answers that question.
So, but most of the companies in Bangalore, Hyderabad are recruiting experienced professionals. Being a fresher, would it, wouldn't it be difficult to get into the data analytics field? So, I mean, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know if this question is based on what the recent uh, job postings are showing, uh, but this was not the case three or four months back. I mean, even I, I, I always keep up to date on uh, who, who those people are, who, what are they hiring for, and, I, and I, I did see a lot of these positions where they talked about one to two years of experience. Uh, but again, given what has happened with the COVID pandemic, it, thinks, it looks like more and more, especially in LinkedIn, and I was even looking at it today, uh, a lot of these roles are talking about senior data scientist positions and you know uh, principal data scientists and things like that. But I think this, this pattern will change. Uh, more and more companies have started realizing that um, you know, we, we cannot be just hiring for these higher level positions. We need junior level positions also. I mean, and most of these and a lot of these companies are also just starting out in terms of applying uh, data analytics. One of my clients that I work for, CenturyLink, they are just they've been doing data analytics after I joined them. Right. So when you start something out, you need a senior person. And then once the team builds, you will see more and more positions being open uh, for, for junior data scientists as well. And like I said, you know, there is going to be a boom in the market. You, you are going to see a deficit in tech talent, especially after these jobs from the U.S. and um, other countries move to India. So that, that's, that scenario will change. So I, I'll just say keep your hopes up uh, if you believe the industry experts. Uh, we, you will start seeing these positions for um, uh, the freshers as well. But if I join a job with one or two years of experience needed for data scientists, how will it affect my compensation? Okay, this is a very, this is a very, very popular question, and I've been asked this question many times when I mentor students um, uh, who are breaking into the industry. The one thing that I'm going to tell you is. You do not have a loan to pay, and if you have money to survive, do not worry about compensation. Right? That is that should be the last thing on your mind if you want to break uh, into the industry, especially given the current scenario. So I would say, even if you were, uh, so let's say if you're working, if you've been working as a uh, let's pick let's pick a role like an electrical engineer for six seven years in a company, and you've been let's say you're making like twenty to twenty five lakhs per annum as an electrical engineer in, a, in company A. And you're going to join uh, a data, uh, you know, join a data scientist role in a, in a startup or something like that. You are going to get a pay hit, right? You you will be making only 12 or 13 lakhs. There is there is no doubt about it. But what you need to keep in mind is what the future is going to offer you. Because as an electrical engineer, you may end up making only 30 or 40 lakhs uh, by the time you reach the end of the career. But in a data scientist role, in 10 years, you may be making eight, 60 or 70 lakhs for all you know. Right? So when I joined uh, the, the startup that I'm working for currently, I took a pay hit. I mean, uh, I, I took a 60% reduction in salary because my priority was to join or to give, or break into the tech field and get into the data science role. I never, I never bothered about the compensation. Right? But today... Since, I mean, now I've moved to India, of course. I mean, I, I, I'm not, um, I mean, my salary is on par with some of those bigger companies and with people who are working with five to six years of experience. So I think, uh, uh, like, again, like I said, it really depends on your socioeconomic situation. If you think that uh, compensation is not going to affect your lifestyle uh, in a very big way, then I would say just focus on, uh, on breaking into the role as compared to worrying about the compensation right now. Because you will you will have to take a hit uh, when you join in a junior role. So keep that in mind. So if we have experience in other language more than eight years and want to switch to data science, then what to do? And don't have data science prior experience. So if you have experience in other language in the sense, are you talking about like a scripting language or a coding language as a software engineer? So if, if if that is if that is what the question is, then uh, so for example, if you worked with Python for eight years as a software engineer, or um, I don't know, like a Java uh, or or something like that, uh, I I would say that um, I mean people even even today people use uh, Java scripting language. Yes, okay. So even even today, you know, uh, people of course uh, the more and more people are talking about Python and things like that. But uh, if you know Java as a coding language, or if you've done C plus plus. 
I think what you need to focus on is learning more about uh, the math behind data, data science as compared to coding, right? Because when you're uh, applying for these roles in um, companies, uh, they're not going to ask you to solve the coding questions with Python, right? You can pick the language of your choice. If you want to do it with R, do it with R. If you want to do it with uh, C++, do it with C++. They don't care because Python at the end of the day is just a tool and that coding language can be learned if you have a um, basic knowledge of data structures and uh, understanding of algorithms. Uh, so the, the focus should be on learning math-based um, uh, uh, math subjects, uh, especially when it comes to now, data science models. So you need to, like I said, you need to do courses on uh, statistics and math, uh, read books on statistics and math. So that, that should be your focus. You need to prioritize that. Uh, and uh, if, if you do that and if you become uh, comfortable with that, then uh, you can, I think you can easily jump into, a, uh, jump into a data science role because at the end of the day, you can, um, uh, I mean, you do, you do have coding experience and a lot of data scientists these days do not have that coding experience. So the, the other the other way works as well. And the other thing is also, it also depends on what kind of role you're applying for. If it's going to be a core data science role, building models and stuff like that. Yes, I mean, it is, it is going to um, uh, be necessary, like I said, to understand, you know, stats and probability and advanced math and stuff like that. But there are roles where, you know, they hire uh, you know, I would say not exactly software developer. Okay, we can call it software engineers uh, with some data science background. So, like if we've done a course in data science. The reason why that is is because uh, th there is a gap between what the data scientists build and when the models actually go into production. So, when the models actually go into production, we ourselves we send all the code that we've written to a software development team, and then they will put it into a proper scripting package. They will uh, do the Docker's, and then they will do the cloud architecture, and then they will. Publish, publish the model for consumption uh, so that it keeps running on an everyday basis. So the, the people are looking for roles like that as well because now you, you know coding, so you can take care of that aspect of it, right? So that I think that, that falls under uh, that could also fall under data science engineer in some in some companies. So uh, yeah, it, it actually falls under data science engineer if I if I remember correctly. So uh, so that is one way of breaking into data science. So you will start by just doing scripting uh, for data science models and everything. And in the meanwhile, you can still work on those data science models. You can slowly make your way into a data science team. And I know people who have done that. So I don't see any other questions. I'll give it a minute or two. If anybody wants to ask anything, and then I'll actually type my email as well. If you want to, if you think of something else that you want answered, feel free to shoot me an email. Or if you want to talk about informationals, or if you want to do a mock interview. So I mean, I I'm more than happy to network and provide guidance. So I'm happy to do that. Because people have been very helpful to me in the data science industry, and it's only fair that I give back to the community. Thank you. All right, so uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for your attention. And I'm hoping uh, you gained something out of this talk. And like I said, free, feel free to reach out to me, uh, LinkedIn, mail, whatever you want, however, whichever you want to use. Um, and have a good rest of the weekend. Thank you for your attention.